We are very privileged to have Dr. Erica Hunter um, with us. Dr. Hunter has always been Dr. Hunter has always been a very um, uh, there's been a lot of warmth uh, with uh, your participation with uh, the Oriental studies, the Oriental churches, with a particular focus with uh, the Church of the East and your studies at Turfan. But I myself have been very um, privileged. Um, um, along with uh, His Grace Mararaham Yohannes, where we have uh, been, if you may recall, Dr. Hunter at a Pro Oriente conference in Salzburg in Austria a few years ago, where we uh, encountered some fascinating discoveries in Turfan, which I believe is somewhere within the region of China, uh, where there were just some Syriac manuscript uh, discoveries, fragments, which were then analyzed uh, with Dr. Hunter and many of the uh, scholars within um, the Near Eastern studies with particular interest and focus on Syriac. Um, just by way of uh, an introduction, so Dr. Hunter, she is an affiliated researcher at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cambridge. And until her retirement in 2020, she was a senior lecturer in Eastern Christianity at the Department of History, Religions and Philosophies um, at SOAS and founded the Center of World Christianity the center of Eastern and Orthodox Christianity. Dr. Hunter's research focuses on Christianity, as I mentioned earlier, in Mesopotamia, and the outreach of the Church of the East in the Caucasus, Iran, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and China until 1500. 
with a special interest in Turfan. She is also interested in the dynamics of Christianity in southern Mesopotamia and the Gulf during the first millennium, seen through the archaeological discoveries and textual evidence. Dr. Hunter was a principal investigator for the Christian Library from Turfan project, uh, which was in 2008 to 2011, and which catalogued approximately 500 plus Syriac manuscripts from Turfan, which are now held in Berlin, Germany. Uh, Dr. Hunter and uh, Mark Dickens collaborate together on the Syriac texts from the Berlin Turfan collection. And a second major project was the transmission of Christian texts from Turfan uh, between 2012 and 2015, which led to the publication of the earliest example of the Khudra, which is the uh, liturgical book that we use in the Church of the East. And this dates to the 8th uh, century, uh, 770 to 884. Uh, Dr. Hunter has also worked with um, another one of our scholars who's been very close to the Church of East, Dr. Coakley, who's now retired at Cambridge, uh, on a text which was the Syriac service book from Turfan. Uh, and I believe there is um, a reference to uh, the Berlin Museum, Dr. Hunter. Mm. Yeah. So without um, any further um, delay, I'll be um, glad to hand you over to Dr. Hunter, but uh, on behalf of his Grace, Mariam Khanis, uh, our parish here. We welcome you. We are privileged and blessed to have you in our presence. And we pray for um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, building um, uh, awareness of uh, the history of our church. And, um, and long may that continue with yourself and, and your esteemed colleagues. Well, thank you very much, Deacon Jonah, for a very fulsome um, introduction. And uh, it is my great honour and privilege to be here, and I'm rather astounded that so many have come out on a cold winter's evening. It is rather cold, uh, but I hope that we will be enlivened by the brilliance of the Church of the East. Now, I'm going to, before I start, ask a question. In the 13th and 14th centuries, which church had the largest geographical spread? That's right. Greater than the Latin church and the Greek church, the geographical spread, the linguistic diversity, ethnic diversity of the Church of the East was greater than these two pillars of Western, Western Christendom. And I want to talk and show you just a few of the treasures and the remarkable discoveries that are still coming to light that document this brilliant presence and productive presence through Central and East Asia. So let's have a look. Uh, let me have the right. Uh, we're going to have a look at a significant presence. I'm first of all going to turn to an area that is actually within Mesopotamia that has often not had the focus that it should have uh, because the North has had the dominance. Southern Mesopotamia and the Gulf We'll a brief mention of India, Central Asia, and China, which is where my research interests are focused. Looking at southern Mesopotamia, and all of you will know about Iraq better than me, in the area that is now, of course, totally Shia area, Najaf, Kufa, Karbala, up till the ninth century, we had a huge and well-recognized presence of the Church of the East monasteries and these Islamic writers, and we do owe that to them, documented the great presence of the Church of the East in the area known as Hira. And Najaf and Kufa are uh, outgrowths of this uh, very... Um, uh, important area of southern Mesopotamia. 
Uh, we have a wonderful view that uh, this shows the, the area looking from uh, over to the Arabian escarpment. And I was very privileged when I was in Iraq in 19, um, 1987, 88, 89, uh, the Japanese were excavating a site which they had thought was a caravanserai because it had walls around it. But it turned out, and this was at the site of Ein Shaya, and it turned out to be a church of the east this, and, and a whole monastery structure. You can see the church um, plan on, on, uh, on the slide. The hatched areas are the areas which the Japanese actually excavated. And some of the finds, and I'm only going to give you a select finds because there are so many, were these lovely coloured, and you can see the red colouring of the cross in this uh, stucco what we call an icon. And that red is the original red. It has not been touched up. These, were, uh, these, are, these showed from the iconography of the cross that it was belonging to the Church of the East. The, uh, the plaster fragments below are from the sanctuary area and they give us some idea of the rich decoration of the church. I was called in because, first of all, my, the, my Japanese colleagues were very fine archaeologists, but they were Buddhists, so they didn't quite have the understanding of a Christian layout as I wouldn't have an understanding of a Buddhist temple layout. So they called me in because they also found Syriac inscriptions, and you can see a fragment of the plaster that had the Syriac inscriptions on in the church. And again, it clearly established it was a church of the East monastery. They also excavated uh, nearby uh, were these keys called dukakin or booths. Um, and in one of the caves which they excavated was this little potsherd written on both sides in black ink. And one of the monks who lived in the cave obviously had a much larger piece of pot, but this only fragment has survived. And it is a fragment from the hudra. Now, I won't have to explain to you what the hudra is. Usually I do but it is a very early fragment of the Hudra, probably 7th, 8th centuries. Again, showing it was the Church of the East. This was a great monastery site, but it was only one of 40 recorded monasteries. The Islamic writers tell us that there were about 40 monasteries. And some of, the, uh, some of these writings are rich because we unfortunately don't have the Syriac sources. But this was one of the sites. Now, this type of monastery or church, it was a monastery because there were other buildings associated. I've just shown you the church. It was the sort of churches that were replicated right down the gulf. It wasn't actually very politically correct, but I'm not a particularly politically correct person because in 1989, when, uh, as we all know, there were difficulties, later on difficulties with Kuwait and Mesopotamia, the French found in Kuwait an identical church site. And right down the Gulf, we have growing archeological evidence showing that the Church of the East extended down the Gulf, probably to do with trade. The great trade routes from Basra, or its predecessor, Spasinucharax, uh, because Basra is a later Islamic foundation, but the great trade routes down the Gulf to India. And of course, it is through the Gulf that the church arrives in India and a very early, uh, of course, development. I shan't go into the development of the church in India, but it is undoubtedly that the Church of the East's presence in the Gulf contributed enormously to the, um, to the growth of Christianity in uh, southern India, in Kerala. 
it's not just archaeological evidence that comes from the, the, the Gulf regions, but also we have uh, literary evidence. Uh, in the 8th and 9th centuries, and we are talking about the Islamic era, we have an enormous and very, uh, very rich uh, flourishing of Christian mystical literature from the Gulf region, from uh, particularly from two authors, but I'm only singling out two, there were many more, Isaac of Nineveh, he was Bishop of Nineveh for a very short time, but he relinquished his post and concentrated for 40 years writing his great mystical treatises. Uh, he wrote them at the monastery of Rabban Shabur, which is now in Iran, but he, he was born in the Gulf, as was Dadishu of Qatar, two men from Qatar. And there was about four, or maybe more, five, ten years ago, a conference just focusing on the great contribution of Christian writers to Qatar in the 8th, 9th century. Their writings were not just confined to southern Mesopotamia, but they show that southern Mesopotamia was a literary powerhouse, producing great works, great works that went west, Isaac of Nineveh, his, his writings went west to the Greek church. Now, we have, you know, you'll all be familiar with um, the theological tensions between various churches. Well, Isaac of Nineveh, of course, was Church of the East, but he was adopted into the Chalcedonian church as Isaac the Syrian. So the name changed, but his works, and his works still today are re read in the Russian Orthodox Church, a very important uh, um, author in the Russian Orthodox Church. So his works went west to Christendom. His works also influenced Sufi thinking, which was prevalent in the area at the same time, and further east into the Christian communities uh, in, east, in Central and uh, Central Asia and China. But we don't actually have any works of Isaac of Nineveh from Turfan, but we do have works of Dad Vishu of Qatar, but not in Syriac, translated into Sogdian, which is an Indo European language, it's old Iranian, spoken by the people who lived in Turfan because they were Sogdian. They were a very major uh, ethnic group. So it shows that these two writers from the Gulf, Church of the East writers, were really international. They went westwards, they went eastwards, and they also surpassed the boundaries of theological difficulties and also passed into other religious traditions such as Islam. And there is a very pari-passu connection between them and the Sufi thinkers. So Hira, of course, renowned for its monasteries, new finds coming up all the time. I believe about three or four years ago when a new runway was being built at the airport at Najaf, that um, uh, if the German archaeological expedition were called out because the runway unearthed, again, these, these plaques that I have shown you, which we found at Ein Shaya, and that it was a monastery site. It doesn't surprise me. Monasteries proliferated in the area. Hera was the burial place of six patriarchs of the Church of the East, enormous renown, and of course, right through southern Mesopotamia to the Gulf, a, a great powerhouse of thinking, probably until we would say about the 10th century, to the, to the end of the Abbasid, main Abbasid period in Mesopotamia. Well, the maritime routes took the Church of the East to India. The overland routes took the Church of the East beyond the boundaries of the Sasanian and later Abbasid empires to Central Asia and China. 
One of the major points, uh, cities in which Christianity did take root, and it was directly a derivative of the, uh, uh, the Church of the East was Marv, which is now in modern Turkmenistan. And it became the major uh, uh, jumping off point for missionary enterprise. And Marv was so important that there were seven major metropolitanates of the Church of the East in the, uh, the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. And we know this because we have the synodical writings that tell us, uh, you know, some good secretary took the minutes and we do have that. And they're very, very valuable, of course. All sorts of issues get discussed, as do modern synods. But we have seven major metropolitans. Six were in Iraq, in Mesopotamia, and Kirkuk was one of them. Nahrain from Kirkuk it was a major metropolitan. Erbil, of course, another major metropolitan. But of the, of the seventh was Marv from Central Asia. And I'm going to show you a slide. Uh, whoops. Uh, Let's, let's go on to a slide. Uh, I'll just take us through to a slide so you can see. Here, um, now, if you can see, we have a pointer here, don't we? Does that show us? Can we? This, this is a pointer here. Uh, on the left hand, where it says Arab Caliphate, Marv, and that was the borderland of the Sassanid Empire, and it was... It was from where, along the silk routes, the silk routes, of course, were really important for a whole host of commerce and trade, but also the transmission of ideas. And I'll go back uh, to where we were. So, Marv, really important for the jumping off of um, the, the, the dissemination of Christianity. Others were Herat in Afghanistan. Again, the trade routes going down to India. Herat was a bishopric between the 11th and 12th centuries. Uh, it still was a bishopric in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, there was rivalry at Marv with, uh, with the Syrian Orthodox Church, but it was a major bishopric. Samarkand in Uzbekistan was a metropolitan and still mentioned in 14th century uh, chronicles. So it was operating as a metropolitan. And I'm very excited that our next conference on Christianity in Central Asia and China will be next September in Samarkand. And I am saving my pennies. Um, and then Xi'an in China, which was the capital of China. Beijing is only 15th century capital. And we know from the Chinese records, the court records are very detailed, we know that um, a missionary, Alapan, arrived at the Chinese court in 635. Now, you just didn't turn up at the front door and knock on it and say, hello, I'm here. You were invited by the emperor. So it was an official delegation. And then, of course, we have the great uh, Xi'an Fool Steely, which is at Xi'an, which is, as I said, the old capital. And you can still see it in the museum today. 781-2, it was date, it has a date. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And then 13th century communities over on the coast. On the left, you can see the Xi'an full steely as it was found. There is Syriac on, but you cannot see that. And that records the presence of the church in China in the 6th and 7th centuries, or the 7th and 8th centuries. This tombstone on the bottom is much later. It's 13th century, but um, again, large Christian communities on the coast of China, the coast the, the coast opposite uh, Taiwan. What you see here, I just wanted to show you the wonderful cross on the clouds, which is a very typical Buddhist motif. But they, So they use the iconography of the surrounding Buddhist cultures, but it's clearly the cross is so important. Now, amongst the... So the, the, the church went 
uh, east, and just here we have, you know, I'm not sure. Ah, here we have the various peoples, the Turkic tribes, the different groups of people that the Church of the East proselytized amongst. Um, so a, a, a very large uh, number of different tribal people. People always ask how many, we just don't know. Um, but certainly the activities of the Church of the East were very um, outreach to diverse peoples. They were truly international, taking the Syriac liturgy to these people who were, of course, not Syriac speakers. And, but the liturgy was always in Syriac, the Hudra. That remains, and that's very clear. So we have this wonderful outreach to peoples, diverse peoples. And we have today many, with the breaking down of the Soviet Union in, um, was it 1991, and the emergence of the Stans, we have many archaeological discoveries that have started to come out. A lot of it, uh, 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 it previously had been confined to Russian archaeologists. Now we have local archaeologists in Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and most recently in Kazakhstan at a site called Ilibalik, which is right, it's a Kazakh area right on the border with China. You can just see some of, and some of the stamped pottery. Now, what was really impressive at the site was um, that an ex a, a cemetery was excavated. And this is really important in the fact that the graves, and you can see there the, uh, all, all, all the bodies, uh, and they're so valuable for um, DNA analysis, etc., had their, they looked east and their heads were on a, a stone pillow. So they, they had a pillow under their head, but they were marked by a gravestone. And on a typical, on the left is the typical sort of gravestone. River rocks, just normal rocks, it was nothing carved or elaborate, but then you have inscriptions. In Syriac writing, with some Syriac terminology, but the names tell us that these people are Turkic peoples. Uh, who, of course, were living or moving through the area because the Turkic tribes are moving through. But what is, again, clear is the cross. Always the cross is such an important symbol of the Church of the East. I think you have the veneration of the cross as one of your sacraments, and the cross is so important. So this has been wonderful. And why is it wonderful? because we have the bodies, we know where the bodies came from, we have the grave markers, which tell us uh, the date of when the person died, the name, and often a little bit of a quotation from the Psalms or something like that. So they're not elaborate literary uh, items, but they're very important for telling us about the composition of the community and we think, and there are men, women and children, uh, we think that from the survey of the graveyard, I was fortunate enough to go out to the grave, graveyard and uh, have a look at, at the tombstones. And my colleague, uh, Mark Dickens, is, 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 is working on these, but I was fortunate to go out there and so that tells us that there was a community of men, women and children, several generations. And we have sent samples of teeth. Teeth are very important for telling about um, uh, genome and DNA history to be analysed. And it shows a very mixed ethnic group. The women coming from western regions and the men from the east. But further than that, I can't tell you because I'm not the um, paleontologist um, who is working on this, but we, we have this wonderful picture into a e Church of the East community right in the eastern regions of Kazakhstan. So far east, it was on the borders with China, and you could see the watchtowers with the Chinese guards. 
being flippant by waves to them, but they didn't wave back. But there you are. Now, so th we have these communities who have settled there, a lot of further work to be done at Ilibalik, but this is just one site that is starting to come out of the Central Asian stands, which shows a rich and long presence of the Church of the East. Preliminary studies, as I said, on skeletal evidence show that there are a mixture of groups, predominantly a local population. And here we have, and this, this little image is in, uh, or plaster fragment, it's only tiny, it's like that, it's not a, a large piece, is in the Berlin Museum, in the uh, Museum in Berlin, um, it was the Museum for Asiatische Kunst, but they've changed and it has got a ch name change. And you can see a priest administering with his a censer and a cup in his right hand to three women who are clearly local women. I think two of them are probably Turkic and we get that from what dress they're wearing. And the third woman, the one furthest on the right with the green, is probably Chinese. Again, showing a diversity of population. But you can see the difference in the face. The, the, the priest, and I assume he's a priest, uh, Saidna Avraham might have some comments on this, but you can see he's of a very different facial features to, to the, the, the three adherents. It has been called the Palm Sunday celebration because of the, the, the fronds that they're holding. Actually, in Central Asia, because they, uh, palms weren't that um, prevalent, they often held willow, and so it could be willow, but I'm not sure. But he is, he is clearly... Um, blessing with the censor. There's been a lot of discussion. The horse's hoof is from some other part of a fresco that has disappeared, so that has no significance. So, but it, we, it, it begs the question, the population were from, you know, proselytised from the local population, the faithful from the local population, the clergy. Did they come from Mesopotamia? Or were they, uh, where were they educated? Were they educated in Marv? Were they, uh, and, and are they Sogdian? Or are they from Mesopotamia? Now my feeling, and I can only say it's a feeling, is because I don't have, um, we don't have categorical evidence, is that probably key figures came from Mesopotamia. The church in Turfan always remembered its links with uh, Seleucia Tessaphon, of course, the patriarchate. And I won't go into that further, but I've written about that. So key figures may have come. But it's probable that um, local, uh, local men uh, were, 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 of course, uh, ordained. And, um, of course, at the monastery of Turfan, which has been mentioned, we have the unsurpassed collection of Syriac manuscripts, which were found by the Germans between 1904 and 1907. A thousand plus fragments written in a variety of languages, but in the Syriac script. So you have 519 fragments that are Syriac, written in the Syriac script, Sogdian, an Indo-Iranian language, written in Syriac, Old Uyghur, which is a Turkic language, and the Uyghurs were moving into the region in the 8th, 9th century. Um, it should be Turkic, not Turkey. Um, Old Uyghur, again, written in Syriac, and some new Persian and one Pahlavi, very, very unique, a Psalter in Pahlavi. Um, so we have a variety of languages showing the different groups that um, were associated with the monastery and that's the site of the monastery and just to give you some idea further this was quite substantial that's myself with a Russian scholar some years ago showing the height of the walls now the Chinese have excavated I kept saying to the Chinese you should excavate you should excavate 
And I thought, well, this fell on deaf ears, but they kept their cards close to their chest because we suddenly found out about a year ago that they'd done a, f a full excavation. You don't plan an excavation overnight. We have had some preliminary evidence come out. They have found more Syriac fragments. They have excavated what they think is the church, but they don't... Um, that, that, that they haven't released all their evidence. Well, the archaeologists have to write their reports, etc. This does take time. So they were interested enough. They have also, I believe, embarked on another, um, a, a, another season of excavation. So the Chinese are interested to excavate this site, and this should give us a much greater indication of the of, of the practice of Christianity at Turfan. We do have some plaster fragments that they have shown one or two images that show they were highly coloured, figurative, rather like the church uh, that I showed you at Hira. So at the monastery site, you had um, major liturgical discoveries. Really, it is... Now, I have to say Turfan is not a major monastery. It probably wasn't. But it's major because we have found the material. Well, the Germans found the material. I just went to Berlin. But I have been to Turfan a couple of times. Um, and major liturgical discoveries. And this gives us an idea of how the liturgy of the Church of the East developed. And we have a slide, as you can see, the earliest known fragment of the East Syriac baptismal <coughs> rite. And we know that the priest was not a native from Mesopotamia because the instructions, and if you see on the second, the first and second line, you can see some writing in red. Well, those are the instructions to the priest in Sogdian so that he would be prompted and he would know what to recite. So. <laughs> He would say, like, and I have translated down the bottom, um, they, they might praise the sovereign of all. He says, that's in Sogdian, that's in the red, crying out, holy, 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 and then in Sogdian it, it says. So it, it, it tells the priest what to do at various stages in the liturgy. And that is a, that is a clear indication that the, the priest... Was, was not from Mesopotamia. But he, he would have learnt Syriac, um, but it still helped him as a Sogdian speaker to have these prompts. Sebastian Brock um, and, and Nicholas Sims Williams published this fragment, and it was a very, very early fragment. I know in the uh, fulsome introduction that preceded me, there was also um, a mention of the Hudra, and this is the work that I published with uh, James Coakley, or Dr. Coakley, on a 61 folio, uh, fragment, uh, a set of 61 folios from Turfan. I'm not advocating that you rush out and buy it because it's very expensive and it probably is rather <laughs> erudite, but it is really important why we had the paper analysed of the fragments. We had the paper fragments analysed, and as was mentioned, 771 to 884 were the carbon dating. And that is the earliest hudra that we know of, and it is the earliest paper, uh, manuscript in paper, Syriac manuscript in paper, Paper, of course, is moving along the Silk Road, so it should never be called the Silk Roads because paper was far more important. Paper was moving westwards from China to the west, and, of course, the literary production at Turfan, it's all in paper. So it shows that the community were, you know, keeping up, as we all keep up with all the computer developments, except I don't because I'm not very good at that, but they were all keeping up. I'd be still writing in vellum and they're all writing in paper, but they were keeping up with the latest developments that was coming across from China to Mesopotamia, a paper mill, 
kept, uh, was established in Baghdad in the late 8th century, shows really this was a very important technical innovation that comes from China. We have the paper analyzed, which gives the dating, but also, importantly, shows that the paper was not Chinese because paper is made from vegetable matter and different vegetable matter has comes up with choose Chinese vegetation to Central Asian vegetation has different results. The paper was somewhere made in Central Asia, so it shows that the communities, wherever this manuscript was written, and we don't know whether it was written at Turfan or at Mart, were already producing paper. So they were well within the wave of technical innovation that was coming through the region. Um, this just shows you the lovely clear writing and His Holiness uh, Ma'awa was after quite some effort to persuade the librarians in Berlin allowed to touch and turn the leaves of the manuscript because the paper is so fragile. But it's 61 folios and it still has its original binding, which is fantastic because that gives you an idea into book production. And it's not a topic that I can dwell on, but book production was really important in Central Asia. And that passed to China. The Chinese adopted the book, probably from the Christian communities, but that's a story for another time. But here we have the Hudra, um, really important, and of course, still a major component, the beating heart of the liturgy of the Church of the East. Now, of course, the Hudra that we find at Turfan is uh, a little different to the Hudra that uh, you use today, which is basically a product of 15th, 16th century manuscripts. And one of my um, projects that I have in mind to work with um, is, is to work out the relationship between what we have at Turfan and we have other fragments of the Hudra, but this is the largest and most complete fragment. We have another probably 200 fragments of the Hudra, how it relates to the 15th and 16th century Hudras. So we have an insight into how the church was operating, the great liturgy. The liturgy was the heart. And although the communities were drawn from all different ethnic groups, the liturgy was always in Syria. And that was the trajectory that linked it back. You can't see this on here, but... Um, the, this Hudra mentions Seleucia Tessaphon. They remember the patriarchate in Mesopotamia. Well, uh, we also have personal items, and those who know me will know I have a very fond of personal items, which shows that not only is the, the church operating on a public domain, but it's also personal. People had personal items of devotion, as we all do today. We have little you know, pieces. I, a lot of people call them amulets. I don't. They're personal pieces of, de of devotions. I call them prayer amulets. And some of them were de de uh, dedicated to particular saints. And here I have a tiny fragment uh, which begins with a quotation of John chapter 1. Verses, uh, just got verses 1 to 2, and of course we will read Christmas John chapter 1, which is probably my favourite verse, and then mentions a saint by the name, uh, by the prayer of Ma Tamsis, and those who are Syriac readers can read the name. Well, it's actually uh, quotations from the New Testament are relatively uncommon at Turfan. A lot of quotations from the Psalms, as you would expect in the Hudra, they are peppered with references to the Psalm, and uh, more uh, also Old Testament quotations. Quotations from the New Testament are 
relatively scarce by comparison. And I don't know why, and it's an interesting question. But anyway, so we were very excited when we sort of realised John won. And then I saw the name, and uh, I have to confess, Mark, who worked with me, we worked very well together, didn't really realise the significance. And I realised that it was going to name a very major saint in the, uh, or, or, or a saint of the Church of the East. Now, I'm just showing this because uh, on the left-hand side, and we will see further on, is a fragment that was cut down from a larger piece. You can see the, the scissor marks or, or the scissors, the straight lines. It's been clearly cut down. The words are cut in half. It was, um, we, we and, and, and this little fragment naming Ma Tumsey's same handwriting, and I pieced it together. It belongs to a much larger piece that was for some reason, we don't know why, was cut down. And we, we searched high and low through the <laughs> fragments. We never could find the intermediate piece. Now, what happened to that, we don't know. But it is clear that someone at the monastery decided to recycle this larger fragment, which was probably the life of Ma Tumsis, and make it into a personal item. Now, the fact is that the sentences are dislocated, they don't form a continuous whole, didn't matter. It was a sacred item, and it shows, again, on the back, you can see the on the right-hand side is the cross, which is, I've enlarged in the centre part, of the Church of the East. And you can see the folds. Someone folded it, put it in a pouch, put it in their pocket. But whatever they did, they folded it. And of course, it is the Church of the East cross because I mentioned the Zianfu stele, which is a stele of consummate skill. They must have commissioned, and it cost a lot to commission, the Zianfu stele was for the imperial court in China, and you can see this lovely cross of the Church of the East with the plural laterals and on, and, and on the lotus. And you can see it's very crude. You know, it's hand-drawn, very crude, but wonderful. It shows that the people knew the, the, the cross and this personal item. And, of course, I think that they, wrote, uh, they, 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 they drew the cross on the, the piece um, you know, when they had folded it up. But it's a recycle, recycling of a much older, uh, a much larger fragment. So um, it was a personal item. I use amulet in a very neutral sense. I would personally say a personal item was much larger piece. Um, uh, now, Ma Tumsis, what alerted me was because many, many years ago, when I was a young whippersnapper, I wrote my doctorate on the Syriac prayer amulets from the 19th, 18th and 19th century communities in uh, the Hakkari, where many of you will, of course, have had ancestors. And Tamzis was a name that kept on occurring. Very rare. I have asked His Holiness uh, if he knows more about Ma Tumzis. Of course, Ma Tumzis was a real person. He's commemorated in your, um, the, the, in your church on the eighth Wednesday after Epiphany. Uh, there are usually only seven weeks after Epiphany till the beginning of Lent. So when you have an eighth one, have a festival to Ma Tumzis, and I will come along, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, because he, pardon? 25 years. Yeah. Years. Right. Well, Hoshabu, send me an email. Um, so uh, why Ma Tumsis is associated with the eighth Wednesday after Epiphany remains an enigma. I don't know. But I owe it to uh, 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 Saeed Hoshaba that he alerted me to the fact that um, the, the entry occurs in the um, Sugada uh, uh, Nasbala or the calendar published by, uh, of the Church of the East, which was published 
by the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission in 1894. So he was a real person, but he descended into obscurity. We don't know. But what's fabulous, and you can see in some of the handbooks, um, we don't know who he was, but he is still remembered in these 19th century little handbooks. They were about the size of that which the priests used to write these personal items of protection. And here you can see a wonderful figure of Ma Tumsi mounted and he's lancing the, um, the daughter of the moon, who's uh, this, it's a cyclops figure, one eye. How Ma Tumsi becomes associated with the daughter of the moon, I don't know. Now we have strayed a long way from Torfans, but what is important is to show that the traditions at Turfan, the, the priests uh, of the, of the community, priests probably writing items, we're not sure, but for the communities, communities using them, these same prayers were still being used in the 19th, 20th centuries. My suggestion is that these items came with the great outward bound mission of the Church of the East from Mesopotamia through to Central Asia and China was disseminated amongst the communities. But the communities disappear in the 14th century for a variety of reasons. But they still continue amongst the communities in northern Mesopotamia, the communities that were isolated due to Tamerlane, etc., in the Hakkari region. So these 18th, 19th century um, prayer amulets, and we have other examples that we've also found at Turfa, show a precious link that continues and in a way completes a full cycle of the Church of the East going out to these very distant regions of Central and East Asia and yet also remaining in Mesopotamia, a continuity when, alas, the very rich and very uh, widespread international presence of the church disappeared from Central and East Asia. And my final slide, just to show you, is another beautiful example of, oh, it's a penultimate slide, of the Church of the East. This is a tiny fragment, it's tiny, it's like a matchbox size, and that's, again, it says, uh, for your handmade made healing, we think it's again a type of prayer. But you can see the beautifully written, uh, uh, drawn uh, cross of the Church of the East. And then from Nishapur in um, Iran, a final, uh, it's an inkwell from the ninth, ninth century. So uh, just a, bit, a, a little tour to show the rich, varied presence the archaeological and textual uh, evidence we have of the Church of the East, which was in the 13th and 14th centuries the greatest church in terms of its geographical spread, the peoples it uh, ministered to, and the languages it encountered. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hunter. We're very uh, privileged to learn a lot about the fragments, the precious fragments that have been found at Turfan in China and the work that yourself and Dr. Dickens and uh, others have um, collaborated together on this special project. We hope it may continue. We look forward to the discoveries of further excavations, as you mentioned, in China and what may come of that as well. Um, we'll have a short moment, if you have five or ten minutes of uh, some questions for Dr. Hunter, and again, we express our gratitude, and we hope we see you on many other occasions. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone want to ask a question? Yes. Just a microphone. Just, I heard about the emulet which you showed, which is, uh, you said it is really a relation of Martin's so yeah, this one to yeah. to daughter of moon. Daughter of moon uh, is a word to word translation. It is literal translation. But mm. in dictionaries of Syriac, like Toma Odo, 
and Ogunmanna, if you find daughter of moon, the translation is epilepsy. Yes, that's this right. This is a disease that's of right. epilepsy. Yes. So this amulet and the prayer of Martin says is to protect the holder of this amulet from epilepsy. Yes, And that's it is right. called Batsara, daughter of moon. Epilepsy is called this name because it used to come to the people who are oh, epileptic yeah. every uh, new moon, yeah, right. you know, and they fall. Yeah. They have this attack of seizures yeah. or epilepsy. Yeah. Mm. So just a note to know mm. that for, for mm. from where come the mm. daughter of moon? It is disease, epilepsy. Yes, well, that, that's a very, very valuable comment. Of course, we don't know how mums... I, I think at Torofan he was not associated with that particular disease, but by the 18th, 19th centuries he is, and I don't know how. We haven't found the intermediate evidence. It would be very interesting... But what is interesting is that Martamsis is known at Torafan and he is a northern Mesopotamian saint and continues, and still continues in your church. Um, anybody else, Robert? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, just earlier in your uh, beginning presentation, I find it bizarre that in the Dukakin cave monasteries in the Gulf contain colourful iconography. Given the minimal imagery in modern day churches in the Church of the East, is there any archaeological studies that suggest when this stopped or if it was specific to the region? Well, the plaster fragments are actually um, probably are not figural, but we do have other material. I, I didn't show it. There is a, th a three-quarter size torso fragment from Tessiphon I don't think the Church of the East was ever uh, as an iconic as, as, as people actually say. And I think scholarly thinking is moving to that direction. The cross, of course, has an extremely <laughs> seminal and symbolic role. It's possible a number of factors may have influenced the, the minimal uh, um, figural... Um, decoration. One is possibly the Chalcedonian prevalence, you know, penchant for figural iconography, icons, etc. Jewish influences, because of course Judaism has a strong and iconic uh, tray, and there was a very strong Jewish presence in Mesopotamia. And thirdly, possibly compounded by Islamic attitudes to figural. But um, what we are seeing from Turfan, and it is too early for me really to make any definitive statement, is you do see uh, the Chinese have shown one or two images that show a figural, but I don't know from where they come in the monastery site because they haven't revealed it but you see the lovely little fresco which was found in a church of the priest and the three ladies. So there, uh, it, it, it's probably not a dominant theme, but I don't think it's an absence either. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Maureen. Dr Hunter, thank you so much. Um, just a general question of my ignorance on the Sogdian languages and some of the other um, liturgies that you showed where it was written in the Syriac but in their language. Yes. Did they have their own script or was it uh, they had their own script but they preferred to write the liturgy using the Syriac script? Well, the liturgy was always Syriac in Syriac script, but we have a lot of other materials, such as the lives of saints that were in, written in Sogdian, but in Syriac script. I think Syriac had a prestige, uh, like Latin did until recently, but there is a Sogdian script that isn't Syriac as well, and uh -huh. there is a Uyghur script that isn't Syriac as well. So they have a variety, a new Persian, of course, there is also, and, and Pahlavi. So um, the Syriac is used, I think, 
um, and, 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 and I mean, there are, there are Christian Sogdian fragments written in Sogdian script. Uh, it, it's not quite clear why they prefer Syriac on some occasions and Sogdian on other occasions. The Uyghur material uh, is a little bit more dispersed in the fact that you have economic documents, etc. So they would use the non, uh, you, they would use a secular script. But certainly um, the liturgical material, and that is why Turfan is so important is because uh, it is solely in Syriac. And the Psalms are translated into uh, different languages, but again in Syriac script. Uh, but, but, but Syriac has that liturgical dominance. But people, the monks would have been trained to read Syriac, but they'd be like people reading Gashuni today. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much for the informative lecture. As always, your lectures are very rich and informative. Uh, question, after Christianity spread through southern Mesopotamia and into Turkey, and with the persecution of the Romans under the Galatian and the Persian, uh, the 40 years persecution, how easy or what evidence did you have for these people who spread the Christianity through the Assyrian Church of the East to the Far East? Did they encounter any uh, persecutions or, uh, you know, just uh, now they established all these churches and they set up the liturgy? What persecutions did they come? Or was it so by the rulers they did not offer any resistance to them as the Romans and the Persians? Well, it seems, sorry, Doctor, but it seems that they've spread there and they've set up churches and there aren't any uh, evidence of persecution, or maybe you have. So, thank you. Uh, it's very difficult to know, but we do know, and I have to emphasize this, the church in, in Victoria had been the church of Jerusalem, and this was the church of Jerusalem, which is how we find it. He's read, obviously, Syria, originally uh, Syria was translated into Chinese and after a couple of years, because that's how long the Indian times took, he became acquainted with the, the writings and he said, this is a harmonious version. So he, the total influence were very Western looking and they allowed Manichaeism, Christianity and Buddhism, which of course is not a Chinese religion, to enter the country and become established. So, but later on in the Tang period, there was persecution of the foreign religions, not just directed towards Christianity, but also to um, Manichaeism. Buddhism ha have a stronger foothold. So you do find that the church s officially disappears, but re-emerges, so where we're talking uh, mid-9th century, but re-emerges in the 11th century. Now, Chinese scholars with whom I have spoken are very interested to know what happens in the sort of 200 years between these two periods. They think the church operated on a regional you know, level. It may be that many people moved to the western areas, such as Turfan, which were Turkic-speaking. We have no evidence at Turfan of persecution, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And certainly in Central Asian areas, there could well have been. And I would have thought um, if the 14th century, 15th century, when Islam is penetrating into the area, and for example, the last Buddhists are forcibly converted to Islam in the 15th century, whether that was the same fate of the Christian communities, we just don't know, but it's possible. But we do know that the Buddhists were forcibly converted in the 15th century, so it's possible for the Christians. So it's, it's difficult to know. I'm sure that there were periods, the ebb and flow depending on rulers, whims, etc. but we do know that China had an official 
d'accord, and in fact the emperor, when he said this is a harmonious religion, granted the, um, the Church of the East two monastery sites in Xi'an. And the, the Tang Chinese records, I don't read them because I don't read Chinese, but I've got colleagues who do. You know, they're very detailed. The, 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 the court records are very detailed. And so they, they mention that. <coughs> and of course, um, the, the, so the Xi'an full stele of 781 records the reception and the acceptance of Christianity by the court. How wide it was beyond the court, we don't know. But this great stele that you can still see um, tells us so much. And in Syriac names on the side and the back, and clearly, again, connected with Seleucia Tessaphon, it mentions the great patriarch who was living at the time. Sadly, he had died by 781. So there's this great conundrum about uh, you know, this stele that is a little bit chronologically incorrect. But you know, long distances, and <coughs> being a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I suggest that the community had paid out a lot of money to commission this stele, and they would have said, look, <coughs> the Chinese emperor doesn't read Syriac, and he wouldn't know the patriarch's name anyway. So you know, he can read the Chinese in the front, and that's what's important. But that's definite evidence, and there's definite accord with the Chinese. And the Chinese are very interested today in the Church of the East because it's a non-Western form of Christianity that came to their country at the invitation of the emperor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hunter. Thank you very much for your enlightened information, uh, Dr. Hunter, on the, those questions. Um, just before we uh, conclude, uh, we would just like to present as a small token of gesture and appreciation from His Grace Moro Roham Johannes. Thank you very much. That's a lovely bouquet which I will grace my hallway back in Norfolk. But thank you so much. And as I said, it's a great delight and a pleasure to be here amongst so many friends of many, many years. And um, when you have major celebrations and I can get down on the train, because the, tr the train from Norfolk don't run so early on a Sunday morning, um, I'd be delighted. And of course, when we have a celebration of Ma Tumsi's, I must come. <laughs> When, when was the last one? Uh, yeah. Yes. It happens every 25 years. Yes. So I can find it in the Sugada information. Yes. I have a copy. Well, if, if you can, I'd love to hear. I will find out and let you know. That would be wonderful. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to, um, we invite you all to the churchyard for some tea and refreshments um, as we conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Dr. Hunter.